Good evening and welcome to the April 20th session of your Brookings City Council. As City Clerk, please record attendance. Attendance is noted and we're all in person this evening. Okay, thank you. That was easy. And uh, next, Council, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Bonnie, please call the roll. Bacon? Brink? Aye. Collins? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Niemeyer? Aye. Tilton Byrne? Aye. Wendell? Aye. Okay, the agenda is approved. Now, the first item is a canvas the elect election results. I'm calling the city clerk, Bonnie, to deal with that one. Mayor and council members and audience, we held our annual election last Tuesday, April 13th, and we are here tonight to canvas those election results. On that day, we had 3,773 voters cast a ballot on or before April 13th. On your screen, you will see the documentation for Vote Center 1, which was located at Brookings Activity Center. You will see that we had, on the scanner report, 780 ballots cast. On our voter registration log, we had 780 ballots, excuse me, names of voters. And on our recap sheet from our Vote Center workers, we had 780 as well. A perfect match. Vote Center 2, we go to Bethel Baptist Church. On our scanner report, we had 1,173 ballots. On our voter registration log, we had 1,169. And when you look at our recap sheet over here, you'll notice what the discrepancy was. And that was we had four emergency voter registration cards at this location. Emergency voter registration cards are for those individuals whose name, for whatever reason, was left off of the registration list. But in a conversation between the vote center location and the county election supervisor, those individuals were allowed to vote. So it, the grand total for this location would be 1,173. Vote center three was Holy Life Tabernacle Church. You'll see here we had on our scanner report, we had 416 ballots. Our voter registration log was 416. And our recap sheet was 416. Aurora Little Hall is precinct four. You will see that we had 39 ballots run through the scanner. We had 40 individuals in that voter registration log. And we had 39 on the recap sheet. The difference of one was a voter who came to the vote center to vote. Upon taking their ballot to go vote it, they did not want to vote. So their name is left in the registration poll list and their ballot goes in the spoiled ballot envelope. So that is our difference of one. Vote center, this is vote center five. This was our early absentees. This would be those who voted in person, by mail, or by messenger prior to April 12th. So on the recap sheet, I'm gonna go backwards on this one a little bit. We had 1,327. This number is represented of six mail or messenger ballots that were received on election day. So they were not recorded in the voter log list or in the e-poll books. The recap sheet also notes we had one provisional ballot. The provisional ballot is indeed another name who their name was not in the voter registration list, but upon um, county election staff doing the research after the election and the resolution board that convenes to evaluate provisional ballots, this voter was allowed to cast their ballot and that number is indeed recorded on your canvas sheet this evening. On the scanner report, we had 1325. We do not know what the discrepancy of the two is, but administrative rule 52944 provides guidance when a discrepancy occurs. If it is less than five, we do not do anything. If it is greater than five, then there's processes outlined. 
So it is less than five, and any difference of those two ballots would not change the election results for that vote center. So you'll see on this is our tables for our mayor election and our city council election. We had 3,734 total ballots in this election, which includes that one provisional voter. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Council entertain a motion to approve resolution 21-031, um, improving the election or the results. Okay, we had a motion. Did I have second? I'm sorry, Holly, second. Any discussion, Council? Council Member Bacon? And Bonnie, I don't want to put you on the spot, but my question out of curiosity um, was the turnout total higher than usual, and was the absentee ballot total higher than usual? It just it felt that way, but I don't know. Yes, the absentees on average was up. Um, in a normal election, not including the 20. 2019, we had just over 400 absentees in that election. Wow. And then for this one, we had 1323 in person. So absentees was up tremendously. Overall, we had a greater voter turnout for this election than we have for any regular city school board election in recent history, probably going back the last five, six years. That's what I thought. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, Council? Please call the roll. Brink? Aye. Collins? Aye. Corbett? Aye. Niemeyer? Aye. Hilton Byrne? Aye. Wendell? Aye. Bacon? Aye. Okay, resolution 21 31 is approved, and congratulations. You're, you're elected officially. All right, next I'll call on uh, CFO Eric Rankel. <laughs> Good evening. As a follow up from uh, member, the Economic Impact Study Group would like to present City Council and the public an update on the, on the progress made for estimating the direct impact of the Sufil Center in our community. With that, I'll let uh, our Executive Director, Tom Richter, get us started. Good evening, Council members, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to present to you. Um, <clears throat> our session goals for tonight are to talk about the estimated return to the impact the events at the Swift Hill Center have on our community. Uh, to define terms uh, direct and indirect spend, uh, and induced spending and give some testimonials and examples. Um, about a year ago, we started reaching out to experts in our community, we being my team at the Swiftel Center to help us capture data from the events that we knew were going to come up in July, the, cat, the National Junior Cattle Shows and, and the Minnesota Holstein Show. And these events were going to happen in a bubble, and we wanted to make sure we uh, captured as much data as we could, with the only, that they being the only events going on in town. So we first reached out to the chamber and visit Brookings and uh, BEDC and ask them to help us figure out what type questions we wanted to ask in these surveys. And then uh, we collected that data and we started adding people to our team. And we wanted experts from our community to look at this and try to validate what the impact really is. And so <clears throat> from my team at the uh, Swiftel Center, Christina Lanko, who's running the computer and the slide projection, and Andrea Hoagie and myself were involved. And then with Visit Brookings, Laura Shane Carbonow sitting next to me, uh, Eric, the CFO from the city, uh, originally, Al Hewton uh, was part of this, and then he retired and left us. And we gained Andrew Sloss, and, and we really like Andrew. He's been a good addition. Um, not that Al wasn't. Uh, and then East Brookings Business and Industry Association. I know the mayor and others uh, call that group a fond another name, but that group also got involved, and Al Kurtenbach and Clint Johnson, former CEOs of companies, um, joined our group. And then Al Baker, uh, former uh, CFO with Fishback Financial and, and uh, First Bank and Trust. 
And so with that, I'm going to turn it over, and they're going to present the information that we had. And if you have questions at the end, you can direct them to whoever. So we're going to kind of be musical chairs here as we go. But we did rehearse it, so it's going to go really well. <laughs> so Laura is up. And just before Laura starts, please, if you come up, speak, state your name, please, so Bonnie can get it in the record. So Okay. Get that. Well, we knew you. I'm Tom Richter. Yeah, we knew that uh, one. Okay. Thank you. Laura? <laughs> well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Laura Shane Carboneau, Executive Director of Visit Staff calculates economic impact for events which apply for our grant program that are held at the Swift Health Center, like the cattle shows. When calculating impact, we factor in things like the length of stay, the travel party size, the primary purpose of the trip, the percent of local versus non-local attendees, and travel spending, those things like eating and drinking and lodging, transportation, shopping, entertainment. All of these things are calculated to come up with the direct impact. An easy way to remember this is direct impact reflects the things people actually do while they're visiting. But we know that travel is much more than just the direct impact. To get a complete picture, you need to look at additional information, such as the indirect and induced impact. Indirect impact comes from the goods and services generated by places like hotels and restaurants. For example, when people come into town for Hobo Day, they eat at Nick's, and the staff at Nick's stock up on buns from the local bakery. That is indirect benefit of travel. There's also induced impact, or something that happens because of travel. Using Nick's again as an example, after a busy Hobo Day weekend, the staff at Nick's get their paycheck. They then use those earnings to pay rent, stock up on groceries, buy a piece of furniture, or spend their dollars um, in other ways throughout the community. When we calculate the impact of events, we use the complete picture of direct, indirect, and induced spending. The way we capture the complete picture is by using a multiplier to reflect the number of times the dollar turns over within the community before it leaves town. Now, each type of industry has its own multiplier, but um, general rule of thumb is the more our businesses and residents use local businesses, the bigger the impact and the bigger the multiplier on the Brookings economy. So this is a very short explanation of a very complex issue, but the main things I want to leave you with as you listen to the rest of the presentation are these. Number one, travel is much more than hotel stays. The effects of travel ripple through the community, providing economic development using new dollars coming into town. And secondly, calculating the impact of travel is not an exact science because each individual person or family acts differently, so there is a little bit of a variance there. These are our best guesses given the information and data that we have available to us. With that short lesson in travel economics, I'm going to turn it over to Eric to talk specifically about the impact of last summer's cattle shows at the Swift Health Center and uh, why they were so important to our community. Thank, Thank you. you. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, given the, the isolated event of the cattle shows, we were able to estimate the direct impact into our community. This was based on a survey conducted to about 250 attendees during the 15 days that the cattle shows lasted. With that, the numbers I'm going to start describing are on the uh, top, top left. The estimated direct st spend, spend for these attendees in lodging, restaurants, shopping, and so on, based on their answers, was about $453,000. In addition, uh, the city also recuperated some, of, some, some funds by receiving direct tax impacted by bid tax and 3B taxes. So altogether, these events provided our community with additional $468,000 uh, for these 15 days. Now, as you all are aware, our city subsidizes the Swift Hill Center. When estimating the subsidy provided for these 15 days, and this is taking the entire subsidy and allocating to all the event days, and those 15 days, the, the estimated subsidy that uh, the city provided for these events is about $55,000. So this means that the $55,000 that the city subsidized the Swiftville Center produced um, 468, or better said, for every dollar subsidized, our community benefited $846. So that's a one to $846 of direct, direct impact ratio. In addition, we, we know that it's still subsidized, but some tax does come back. 
some of the city subsidized, so the city was able to recoup 27%, or about $14,000. That means that it's still subsidized by 73%, or around $40,000. So with that, we can show that there is value, direct value of these uh, events in our community. Now, a disclaimer, these events are, are one of the highest economic impact because of their nature. The attendees usually stay in town and it's part of the experience to enjoy our community. But that is why the Swiftfield Center, given the success and the impact, is aggressively pursuing more cattle shows with our current available resources. CEO of Brookings Economic Development, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, I only have one slide tonight, and this is it. The economic impact out and inflow uh, chart, which I'm sure some of you guys have probably seen in a number of different factors in your work as a city council. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing it, but the basic concept shows that the community residents and visitors pay taxes into our community, which get paid to the city, of course. The city then uses them for tourism programs, promotions, activities, and other facilities, such as the Swift Hill Center that not only attract out-of-town visitors, but also help to provide amenities to our residents. Uh, and as you'll see in a little bit later in our slideshow, help me recruit businesses and workforce to our community as well. Uh, those out-of-town visitors, as well as our community members, of course, then spend that money here in our local community. That money then goes into creating income and jobs for the local community, which then, of course, results in our local uh, uh, residents paying taxes back into the city. Uh, the one thing I wanted to stress, obviously you heard Eric talk and you heard Laura talk, one thing from an economic development standpoint that's really important and crucial to understand is while there is this ROI and there's economic impact, there are certain aspects to the Swift Health Center and other amenities that we have that can't be measured by dollars, no matter how much we'd like. And as the economic development representative here tonight for the city and county of Brookings, I cannot stress how important it is that we have a center like the Swift Health that can put on an event so that we can provide a high quality of life for our residents and be able to showcase the things that our community has to offer for opportunities to attract workforce and to attract other companies to relocate here in Brookings. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slaw. I'm Al Kurtenbach, a longtime Brookings resident, and I currently serve as a chair of the East Brookings Business and Industry Association. And uh, Swift Health Center is in East Brookings, so we have a great interest in that. And I want to talk about uh, kind of a that you can kind of grab onto and and get an I, I extrapolate that then to others. And so at the Swift Health Center, there are generally four types or four categories of events that are held. Uh, those that we call spectator events, and then exhibition events, and participation events, and then uh, banquet events, those four categories. Now in 2020, the spectator events were kind of wiped out by COVID-19, but uh, they are really something that the community looks for. They, if you can bring a big band to town or a popular band, that's what the uh, you know the community looks for, and uh, the impact now the financial impact. Uh, I'm measuring that by uh, a proxy for the hospitality industry, and that proxy would be the My Place Hotel. I can, I've got access to hard data there, and so I thought that makes a good uh, measure. Uh, and also, I'm looking at uh, the two for return. I'm looking at the impact that takes place on site, as well, and on site being at the Swift Health Center, and then also off site, which is all around Brookings. So, for the spectator events, which are uh, primary type is concerts. They have a very large on-site impact. I mean, there's money paid at the door. The counselors can get a report on that. You can see those uh, hard dollars that come at the door. The uh, off-site impact is what I think is medium. 
because uh, most of those people are local. They don't rent a hotel room or they, a few of them might go out to dinner before they go, but, you know, so the, uh, the off-site impact is kind of medium. Now, for those exhibition events, which the cattle shows last summer really highlighted, uh, there, uh, there's a, a large on-site impact and also a large off-site impact. I don't know if any of you happened to drive the parking lot during that, but it was impressive. I mean, there were license plates from, you know, going out three, four states. Uh, and, and those people hung around for two or three days, and those mm -hmm. were, they, they were called the National Youth uh, tr a Cattle Show, like the Charley Youth and Scimitar Youth. So, they also turn out to be recruiting events for SDSU. And, and yes, you know, we have to pay them to come to town. They came to town on their own dime. And so that, that uh, they were fantastic. There were uh, 19 days that I counted. Uh, I didn't count while they were setting up and that, but, and uh, of those 19 days, uh, there were both weekday and weekend days but the occupancy at the hotel was uh, average 98% for, for those 19 days. Then for the participation events, those are very interesting. If you look in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you can see a whole bunch of pool tables lined up there. Uh, for those pool events, I went to, I've gone to those too, just to walk around and look. 120 pool tables set up. And you know, you don't, by one person at a table, usually there are two or four at a table, so a lot of people participating. And, uh, and, and likewise for dart events, the, uh, there were like three or four uh, dart events, including the Pink Ladies dart event, and th those are very interesting also and, and competitive, and, and the people don't compete 24 hours a day, they have their time to compete and then they go and wander around a little bit. And so they have time to do a little shopping and, and uh, generate uh, sales tax revenue while they're here. Uh, they, they, they have kind of a small on-site because, uh, you know, there's, there are no spectators or very few. The family members are spectators, but not like a concert. But the off-site contribution, the offsite impact is really super, really good offsite impact. And, and for those, there were 14 days that just kind of really the weekend days there uh, uh, it, with over 94% occupancy at the hotel. Then the banquet events, and there is a, a really good kitchen there at the Swift Health Center. The, uh, I put in the NAIA uh, track and field event, even though it was in, in uh, 19, because that was such a huge event for the city of Brookings. And to have the university and the city cooperate like they did was just really tremendous. Uh, and <clears throat> I went out and drove the parking lot that night, too. And, and there the, there were, you know, 40 and 50 passenger buses, and and actually from you know as far west as California and Oregon, and as far east as as uh, you know uh, New Jersey and uh, and New England and and along the south too, uh, it was uh, and Swift Hill hosted that banquet for the whole group and served uh, 1,600 people that night. I'd venture to say that was probably the largest banquet we've ever had in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and then the other uh, type of banquet that really surprised me when I looked at the data were uh, wedding, wedding receptions. And, uh, and for them, I, most of them were on Saturday. I count it Friday and Saturday night uh, because, you know, typically at the hotel, the Weekends, uh, attendance is light, and so we're always looking for ways to fill it on the weekend. But the uh, uh, 
uh, wedding receptions, there were uh, 17 event days. That was probably about, uh, you know, uh, seven weddings. Some of them are, sometimes there's a wedding on Friday night and on Saturday night. And uh, for them, the uh, on-site impact is not that great. But the, uh, for the wedding receptions, but the off-site is, is really significant because, uh, you know, some, you know, since we have SDSU here in the community, a lot of those couples meet while they're in school, and so their families are not from Brookings. So the families come in from out of town, and so Brookings has a chance to benefit from that. And so uh, uh, there again, uh, you know, you can look at that data. I, I was really impressed by it. And so uh, if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to try to answer them. Hey, don't see any, so thank you, Dr. Kirtenbach. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Clint Johnson with East Brookings Business. I reached out to a few leaders in our city and the impact on their businesses relating to recruiting and retaining employees in Brookings. Jay Bender of Falcon Plastics. The Swift Tell Center is an, economic, an important asset for Brookings that helps both retain and attract employees to the area. Next is from Carla Gatsky of Dactronics. We frequently hear from our Brookings employees that what they value about Brookings is the access to entertainment and recreation typically associated with an urban center. Keith Malam of SDSU Foundation Swift Health Center has helped make Brookings a very attractive destination for individuals and families. Next is Kevin Tetzloff of First Bank and Trust. Swift Health Center plays an important role in our quality of life standards here in Brookings. President Barry Dunn of SDSU, just taking a clip out of that, you've helped attract and hire excellent employees because of the quality and varieties of events that you have held. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I'm Al Baker, and it's only appropriate goals and revenue slide. The slide itself addresses the city's goals for discretionary income spending and quality of life. As a retired banker, I dealt with economics every day. Uh, one definition of economics is a study of how uh, individuals and businesses, and more directly for our case, how governments uh, make choices about how to allocate resources. Our group believes that the city's choice to allocate resources to the Swift Tell Center has paid high dividends for the community. Eric and Al Kurtenbach have shown numbers that prove substantial direct spending in our community by residents and non-residents as a result of the events at Swift Hill, which in turn generate direct tax revenue to the city. 2020 was by far not a normal year, but in a normal year where all direct spending is tracked, we have no doubt from the work that was done that the tax revenue to the city would easily exceed the subsidy from the city. Laura has shown how these dollars circulate throughout the community over and over again thus creating additional direct revenue to the city. But economics is more than numbers. As a business person in the community, I have seen direct benefit of having Swift Tell Center, as well as some of the other amenities in town, be a key to hiring personnel, convincing spouses to move to the city of Brookings and how great a place it is to live, and it also just brings an energy and enthusiasm to the community that can't be adequately captured in numbers. From our perspective, a subsidy to support the Swift Tail Center checks all the boxes for a great investment in the city of Brookings. Now we open the floor to your questions or comments. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Council questions, comments? Yeah. Councilman Wendell. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm not sure exactly who am I most appropriate to, rec to direct to Tom. Um, I've really appreciated uh, during my time on the council the way your staff has continued to pivot and evolve the business model 
Um, certainly in the last year, you've, you've had to do that in some extreme circumstances. Uh, and we saw, I think, the results of chasing down some pretty impressive agriculture-related uh, programs uh, this summer. Um, I know that you've done a lot of thinking about how we expand um, our ability to continue to attract those types of shows and those types of programs, both as a facility but also as a community. And so I'm wondering how we just continue to position ourselves to attract those types of regional and national shows. I'm thinking in particular as the state of South Dakota has made some considerable investments like on the state fairgrounds and in locations that are not in Brookings, um, what we do in response, knowing that those are the types of events that can have a tremendous uh, ROI for the community. Uh, thank you um, for that question. We are working on a few things behind the scenes as far as expansion and possibilities that we think would uh, allow us to attract more regional and national, in this case, livestock type events. But we're also looking at our ability to attract more convention and conference and meeting business. They're, they're basically the same event. The cattle shows are a convention where you bring your calf with you to show it. Uh, that is really what it is because they're doing everything during the week that a convention e would do they they're doing contests and meetings and banquets and all that stuff and vendors that are selling products so one key thing is is that we've been talking about hopefully someday getting a private partnership pri public private partnership with a hotel development group and um, and we're hoping that that will be that could happen in the future and we, and we can build off some of the success that we saw this summer you know, COVID was terrible for our industry, and, and you're right. We had to try to reinvent what we were going to do to, to survive, and we have so far, but we're not out of it by any means. I mean, we aren't. And, but one thing it proved that those cattle shows, it gave us the opportunity to really dive into the impact that they have on our community, and, and as shown in this presentation tonight. So... We're hoping this will help us with momentum to continue to look at those possibilities, but we have to also try to attract things with the current footprint we have today. Um, so uh, we are trying to do that, um, and uh, I think we're going to come out of this pandemic strong at some point, and we're already seeing activity with going on sale with the prices right last week, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I don't Hopefully that answers your question. But. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Just a couple of comments, too, that were spoken to, but the quality of food and the service, I hear that often from people. And Dr. Kurtenbach was speaking to the NAIA students, and I was there that night with the Visit Brookings folks, welcoming them and talking to them, and they just couldn't get over the quality of food for that large number of people. And I hear that every time we're at a banquet or somebody else out there and, you know, Matt and his team and everybody, Tom, they just do a fantastic job. And as you're out recruiting, I, I guess I got to, when I get home, I'm going to get asked this question, so I might as well ask it now. When are you bringing ZZ Top back? I'm sorry, I didn't hear <laughs> Oh, yeah, when are you bringing ZZ Top back, oh. Tom? <laughs> <laughs> we'll work on that. Well, I know but I'm going to get emails. We have Willie Nelson coming. <laughs> How about that? August 11th. All right, I'm going to be followed up here. Tom, real quick, if you could maybe introduce your staff. I, for If it's oh. not for a lot of your staff members, a lot of these things would never happen. I know a lot of times I hear stories of your staff working countless hours, sometimes even potentially sleeping at this hotel to make events happen. Mm -hmm. And though they're not city employees, we still value them and the efforts that they provide for your service and for this community. So if you would, just take a moment to introduce your staff to the public watching at home. Yeah, I think everybody's here. Christina Lanko is over running the... PowerPoint presentation. Scott Smith is in the back there. Uh, Andrea Hoagie. And then in the back row is, is the, our executive chef, Matt, that's mm -hmm. largely responsible for the food. But yep. when I, I, then everybody's going to laugh on my team. But when everybody does their job well on our team, it's, it's like uh, we're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. But when everybody does their job, we set up I, whoever's booking the event, we get it booked, and then we set it up and we work with them and help make everything go well, the food tastes a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And if we mess up one of those steps, the food's still going to be good, 
but you know, so we're all a team. But Matt makes the food. Mm -hmm. And then uh, next, uh, yep, yeah, we have Jake Melius <laughs> with us in the back, and I always get him mixed up with Mesky, and that's why I was stumbling <laughs> there for a minute, Jake. And then Jenna Palmer, Natalie Nagelhout, and is that everybody? What was that? Molly. That, oh, I, that's what I just said. Molly Nagel. <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you for recognizing them. Um, we have the best, we're second to none, that team in our industry. And so I'm very proud of them. Council Member Bacon, start down that way and come this way. Um, I just want to thank you for tonight and all of your staff for everything you've done. I know we've been hard on you in recent years um, because we had, we had to understand what our subsidy was going for and how that was benefiting our community. But I think you've been able to put together um, excellent data for us so that when folks come to us, we, have, we can support that with data um, so that we continue to support you because you do, all of you bring something very special to our community. So thank you. Thank Hilton you very Hilton. much for that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the volunteers on this economic impact study group, because they didn't have to be part of this. And I thank them every time we meet, and we've met many, many, many times over the last year. And um, I just truly appreciate that you guys were involved with that. So thank you. Now, Councilmember Tilton Byrne. Um, I first want to <clears throat> thank everybody who did participate on this committee for this presentation. I think it was put together in a way that was really easy to understand, and I think it not only helps us to understand the economic impact, but hopefully it'll help the community understand it as well, as, as I hope that they take a look at this and, and hear the presentation tonight. Um, and again, just to echo some of the previous comments, thanks to your staff for everything they do, because I think obviously the work you guys do makes a great impact. Um, my question is, um, as, as folks do start to get um, vaccinated and COVID seems to be um, maybe leveling out at least a little bit and things are kind of getting back to normal, um, what are the projections for the future at this point looking like? I assume we're maybe seeing a little more events being booked at the facility and, and maybe seeing a little bit of an uptick in at least um, hopeful pr projections for things that can take place in the future. What's it looking like compared to maybe 2019 when we weren't facing COVID? Well, well 2022, uh, the, everybody in our industries says it's just going to be crazy because every all the pent-up uh, demand for going out for entertainment and the artists that need to go out. And so that's going to get crazy. And um, But for the fall, we adjusted um, our budget through August into September. Um, if Willie Nelson, which we fully believe that date will play, things are going to continue to take off. And our fall is starting. We had an event planning meeting today, and they were talking about uh, October that it's going to be it's going to be crazy because the next thing is is what everybody in our industry and many others are struggling with right now is trying to ramp back up and get employees come back and so we're getting nervous but we're working you know that's five six months out but we're trying to get prepared for that right now are we seeing similar increases in bookings for things like weddings and events like that as well yeah, the weddings have been um, very strong for us, and, and um, we just had one on Saturday night that was going to be in Minnesota, but because of the COVID um, issues there, they brought it here, and it was uh, over 300 people, which is a big wedding, and we did it on the arena floor, and uh, so our wedding business looks strong into 2022. Thank you. Okay. Councilman Collins. Yeah, this is very, uh, very impressive PowerPoint, and I want to thank everybody that came up and talked on your behalf. Thought that was great. Um, I remember uh, when, when we talked in your office about the economic uh, impact that the Swift Tail does um, at the cattle show. With that I don't know if you remember that or not, but it was at the cattle show, yep. and um, because of the loss every year. But you explained to me about um, 
the impact that the Swift Hill Center has has all over Brookings, and it's nice to see it in a present. It's nice to see it in a presentation, and it makes sense to me. And very good job. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. And that was one positive thing of COVID that allowed us to have those events in a bubble and really measure what that impact is. So trying to find some positive things. Well, the other thing is the pod. I, I don't know where we'd have held the pod if it wouldn't have been for the Swift Health Center. The yeah. pods, I should say. Number of people vaccinated. And, and you know, and how your team put everything together like that. And I know working with the healthcare system, outstanding, but it ran just as smooth as you could imagine. And we were out there one night after, well, they just finished the pod and then we had a retreat out there and everything, you would never know in it. So again, yeah. your staff is just, I can't say enough good about them. We were just a small piece of that puzzle. That group, um, the pandemic planning group had been meeting for uh, probably close to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I remember those first years in 2007 or eight wondering, you know, are we ever going to really utilize this? Well, holy tamale, did yeah. we? But all that planning made it go so seamless. And there were a lot of people that hadn't been out when they came that first pod to get mm -hmm. shots and how smooth it went. They felt comfortable being out in the, you know, with people. And yeah, it, we are just a small part of that. Thank you. But those volunteers that helped, that was amazing. And we have our fifth one, I think. Thursday. Mm -hmm. So hopefully more people will come out. Hope so. Council member Tilton Byrne. Um, since the pod on Thursday came up, it might be a good time to say that they are now accepting walk-ins for that um, vaccination event. So even if you don't have an appointment for it, you can walk in, show up, get your shot and be vaccinated. Anything else on the Swift Hell economic impact? And echo what's already been said. Thanks to all of you that work on this because it Thank is so important much. to our community. Thank you. All right. Eric Witt, the engineering manager of Brookings Municipal Utilities, coming up. And where's everybody going? We still got four hours left. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they've been to these meetings before. You can clear a room. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not you. I, I see another guy coming up towards the front that I was just wondering there. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Thanks for having us tonight. Uh, I'm Eric Witt, the Water and Wastewater Manager at BMU. And tonight's presentation is the Water System Facility Plan. Uh, it's a project I'm pretty excited about. It is the roadmap for the next 20 to 25 years for the water system with a focus on the water treatment plants and an upgrade. Um, the consultants who helped us out with this presentation are AE2S uh, with us tonight, Delvin DeBoer and Brian Bergentine. Uh, they'll run through what a facility plan, uh, the facility plan, which is a state requirement um, for funding and to uh, submit our designs. So with that, I'll turn it over to them questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Delvin DeBoer. I'm the project manager uh, on this project and uh, formerly was from Brookings. I spent 30 some years of my life here enjoying the fabulous drinking water and just uh, looking forward to uh, providing this roadmap and helping the system provide the roadmap for sustainability <laughs> into the future. Um, our outline, to, well, before I do this, um, I just want to acknowledge the, I guess I'd say the steadfast um, work of the team. And the team in a planning effort is not just the consultants, it's also the system. And the uh, city of, uh, I'm sorry, the Brookings Municipal Utilities team, their, their water team and management really put forth strong effort in contributing to this. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that and, and let you know that the outcome of this is actually a, a team effort. It's just not a consultant coming in saying this is the way to go. So I just uh, want to let you know we appreciate that. Okay, uh, four topics tonight. The first will be an introduction and project need. The second, planning parameters and reviews. A third, project alternatives and recommended alternatives. And then finally, the funding and implementation step. I'll be handling the first two of those topics and Brian Bergantine will introduce himself, will handle uh, the second two of those. 
first of all, in terms of the system, let's just do a little introduction of the system you had. I really appreciated what the Swiftel folks were doing there, just sort of providing some education and so forth. Here's a little education on the system that provides water to you. Uh, it has three parts. It has the supply, which is the aquifer from where the water comes from. It has the treatment side, and then it has the distribution side. Your water comes from uh, uh, the Big Sioux Aquifer, which has two arms that follow the Split Rock, sorry, the Six Mile Creek and the Deer Creek. Uh, Six Mile Creek is north of town. Deer Creek is on the east side of town. And so you have well fields in both of those aquifers. The well field on the north side of town serves the north water treatment plant. The well uh, field on the east side of town serves the, actually, if I map, uh, the well, well field on the east side of town serves the east water treatment plant. The north water treatment plant is the older of the two. It was built in the 30s and expanded in the 50s and in the 70s. It's a 2.5 million gallon per day water treatment plant. And there's also about uh, 1.5 million gallons of storage on site. The well field at the east, I'm sorry, the treatment plant at the east, uh, at the east site is a 4 million gallon per day treatment plant. Uh, it has uh, uh, 3 million gallons of on-site storage for treated water. Those treatment plants uh, use lime softening to soften the water, remove hardness from it, and also remove iron and manganese from the water and then disinfect with a chloramination system. Those treatment plants um, then provide water into the distribution system. The distribution system is divided into two pressure zones. On this map, the blue lines represent the high pressure zone that serves the east side of town, including the, the industry, and also actually there's a pipe that goes out to Aurora and provides water to that consecutive system. And then it also circles around the south side of town and serves a lot of the new developments that are, are happening on the south side and the west side of town. The green part is the low pressure zone, and that low pressure zone serves the central area and the northwest side of the area as well. There are three towers serving the system. Two of them are in the high zone, a half a million gallon tower in 22nd Avenue and a 750,000 gallon tower on South Main at about 20th. And then a brand new tower that got just built this last year. And to me, it's a monument. <laughs> Other folks, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a water tower, but you know, to me, it's just an exciting thing to see that go up and just be a, a great uh, result from actually the city of, of Brookings work. But, uh, uh, Brookings Municipal Utilities work. But anyway, that's the system. And our job is to look at that system and decide what its future is, what's needed to expand that system to provide a sustainable, safe drinking water uh, uh, system. And so uh, I want to make sure that I, yep. So out of that comes uh, what we might call the needs or objectives of the planning work. Systems getting old, so there needs to be some replacement consideration a lot of the facilities are obsolete, uh, parts of the facilities, and so there's consideration of what needs to be renewed. It needs to meet the future demand. So there needs to be some projection of what that demand would be. And then planning needs to happen to meet that demand, that water demand. Uh, the city is absolutely foundational on that the system have reliability and redun uh, redundancy. And so the utility made that be a, a major focus of the planning work. And then finally, uh, that report that comes out of this serves as the basis for an application to the state revolving fund for funding of uh, the improvements. We always have a planning period to look at, um, whether you do comprehensive planning or facilities planning. In this case, the key planning period is 2045, which is uh, typically equal to the service life of a lot of the equipment and so forth that's a part of these facilities. Although the structures last longer than that, uh, a planning period seems to correspond with that 25-year to 30-year window, which also corresponds with uh, you know, some of the SRF loan uh, terms and so forth. There's also a 2075 20, 20, uh, planning period or a date that is looked at uh, when you're looking at long-term uh, sustainability of the water source. And so when you look at the well field and you look at the potential need for water, you want to make sure that you have sustainability in that side of things. Um, and so uh, the, the real key planning period for this work, though, is the 2045 planning period. And uh, a couple of figures off to the right to remind me to mention that, uh, like with anything that you do, 
you have to estimate the population to decide who's going to be here and how much water they're going to need. And this represents just a different uh, projections. There's high projections, low projections. And uh, the, uh, the group uh, decided a projection for 2045 of about 35,500 people. And in looking at other projections that have been done, uh, the city just completed a, a 2040 comprehensive plan. And in that plan was a 2035 number of about 31,000. And that happened to fit right on the projection line. And so um, it's one of those feel-good things that you know, we're, we're in, in tune with what other folks are thinking in terms of population projections for the community. That population's used along with a per capita demand. That per capita is how much water does each person use. And so there's trending of those demands to decide, well, what's a good number for that? And based upon the history of water use in the community, that number was found to be about 129 uh, gallons per person per day. That number's multiplied times the future population to come up with the estimated average day demand. And that effort, estimated average day demand is uh, 4.6 million gallons for the year 2045. Um, you design the system to meet the peak. Uh, if we just designed for the average day, you'd run out of water when, during the summer when people are watering and so forth. And so that peak day demand is found by multiplying that average day demand by a peaking factor. The peaking factor is developed by uh, considering uh, ranges of peaks that have uh, happened in the past and looking at some trends. For Brookings, that peaking factor is about 2.17. So multiplying that times the 4.6 average day demand, you get a peak day demand of uh, 10 million gallons. That 10 million gallons then is used to design the future size of this uh, facility. Uh, uh, I'd like to conclude my part with just looking at some of the reviews that were also done. Uh, we also look at the existing system to decide uh, how much of it is usable or reusable or can be reconditioned to the future. And in looking at the North Water Plant, it was determined from a tr structural perspective and from an equipment perspective that that really has served the city well, but it's reaching the end of its useful life. It's also located in the floodplain. And uh, that's not the best place to have a facility, especially when you need it <laughs> uh, during hard times. And so uh, as a result of that, it was decided uh, to um, retire that facility, um, maybe give it a blessing as it goes out the door. Uh, but the, um, uh, and then uh, for the other facility, which was built in, uh, in the 70s, that one still has some good life left in it. It's structurally sound. It does have some uh, uh, features that need to be improved. There are some code issues that uh, need to be um, worked on. And uh, in addition to that, some equipment would need to be replaced. And then finally, there's a couple of process uh, improvements that could be done relative to uh, sludge storage and, and reclaim and things like that. And so it was felt that that uh, facility still has useful life and figured into some of the alternatives uh, that were evaluated. Also, a uh, big question is, you know, what about that treated water quality? And in the discussion on the team, it was determined that the existing water quality is, is actually very competitive with what other, other communities do, and it's very good water. Um, you know, my kids grew up in this water, and they turned out just fine. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, it is great water if you compare it to uh, what other communities have. And the city, the, city, the, st the team uh, determined that, that just continue with that water, um, continue with softening, iron and manganese removal, disinfection and so forth. And then finally, uh, the work also included an evaluation of the distribution system. A hydraulic model was developed as a part of this work and was used as a tool to evaluate several things that happened, or that needed to happen in order to make the system grow into the future. Uh, the figures on the right are just illustrations that uh, came out of that work that illustrate uh, the need for a 20-inch line uh, to be built to help serve the expansion on the south side of town. Uh, currently, there's actually not enough piping to serve the maximum day demand and keep the water tower on South uh, Main in a good operating space. And so as a part of the facility planning and extending that into the future, it was determined with this model that that 20-inch pipe becomes a, 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 a part of the planning for the future. So what I'd like to do then is just turn this over to Brian Burgatine. We call him Bergie. 
Um, we'll just call him Brian for today, and uh, he'll continue on. Thanks, Dale. Say thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. As uh, Dell mentioned, my name is Brian Bergentine. I'm uh, Operations Director for AE2S. Today I'm going to talk about the, the water system facility plan and what we went through with, with the various alternatives that we developed as we looked at where we're going to go with the future. And we, we ended up developing 13 alternatives. The start of it, looking at where we were going to grow, uh, expanding the water system, of that, as we started to look at them, there were eight of them that were dismissed. And those were dismissed for a variety of reasons, and you can kind of see them up there. Some of them were the availability of land for purchase. Some of it was we, we wanted to make sure that we weren't locating or siting our plant in an area that had a, a wellhead protection area so that if we are delivering chemicals and something spills that it wasn't causing some damage to that wellhead protection area. Poor site uh, soil conditions was one. And in the site, we talked about the floodplain. We wanted to make sure that when we build, that we're constructing that outside of the floodplain. Finally, we looked at some of this from a kind of a cursory or high-level review, and overall project costs for some of them were, were very high, and so we eliminated those. Of the five that were remaining, there were two that we, we have to do as part of the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund program that you need to look at. One is no action. The other one is being served by any kind of rural water system. As we looked at those, both of those were eliminated for further consideration because they do not meet the water demand needs as you continue to grow when we look to that 2045, it did not meet that demand. So the three main alternatives that we considered within this plan was alternative one, which is a new 6MJD water treatment plant on 34th Avenue, what we call site B. We had gone through multiple sites and renovation of the 4MJD East water treatment plant. As Dell had mentioned, there was components within there that still very viable, and we wanted to make sure if, when we looked at it what we could do to upgrade that. The second was looking at kind of a phased approach, a new 6MGD plant with kind of that future 4MGD that would be sized. And so you're looking at something that would have a little bit smaller 3MGD kind of process trains is what you'd be kind of duplicating that for that reliability. And the last one was looking at kind of a single phase construction, alternative three was a 10 MGD water treatment plant. We're a little larger, still duplicating that redundancy but with five MGD process trains. I'm gonna show a couple of the, the, the three different alternatives that we had and you can see them on here. We, we, we talk about the various well fields that we had, both the north and the east well field. We looked at expanding the, the wells within them to meet those demands. We have some different routing that we looked at. You can see in the solid green line, that's showing the raw water pipeline. We also show alternative routing that we selected because the pipe routes are preliminary right now by nature. We needed to be able to have those during the process to make sure that we looked at kind of the environmental considerations of it. But we have a couple different routes that we're looking at. And so you can kind of see the preferred and then also one of the, what we'll call kind of that secondary route for each of them. Same thing with the, with the final finished water lines, you can see we have a couple different routings for that. We looked at the site of the alternative one along 34th Avenue, site B, and that renovation of the water treatment plant. The second alternative, alternative two, that was very similar in nature, but what you're looking at there is that instead both the 6MGD water treatment plant and the future water treatment plant will be constructed at that site along 34th Avenue. And finally, on alternative three, it's very similar in nature when we talked about it and you're, you're, you're trying to get water to certain areas within the town, but it's now taking that 10 MGD. So you've got some differences in sizes of lines that you, you'll see throughout each of these alternatives, but very similar types of approaches. When we look at the project costs for, for the projects, we, we looked at it from two different standpoints, one with residuals management using lime sludge ponds, one using mechanical dewatering. You'll see in each of these alternatives that we provide up here that the, the mechanical dewatering is the more expensive option over the lime sludge pond option. For the 6MGD water treatment plant at 34th Avenue and the renovation alternative one, we were looking at roughly 53, $54 million. 
for the mechanical dewatering option of it, $55.6 million. For the alternative two, the 6MGD, and now then constructing another 4MGD later on, we were looking at 61.1 million for the line sludge pond option and 63.6 million for the mechanical dewatering option. For alternative three, which is that single, I'll say phase construction, just one phase, 10 MGD, that's 53.6 million on, on the lime sludge and 56. So you can see that the lowest one on here was alternative three, and the next was alternative one, and then alternative two with the highest cost. As we sat down and, and met with BMU and talked about from the utility standpoint, what's the best way to approach this? There was many things that we wanted to think about. You know, as water treatment plant regulations continue to evolve and change, demand and how the patterns kind of change throughout time. You know, how, where is the growth going to happen within the city? And so con construction from a phased approach seemed to be the best route. And so alternative one is what we ended up with the lime sludge pan ponds as the recommended alternative. The phase one features that you would be seeing under this first construction is expansion in the well fields, new raw water lines that are going to be supplied to that 34th Avenue site water plant, the construction of a new 6MGD water treatment plant. And as I mentioned, those will be two 3MGD treatment trains, so that process redundancy that they kind of need to have or want to have. We would construct new lime sludge ponds near the 34th Avenue Site B, and then finished water pipelines would be connected, 16-inch water from there to the 34th Avenue. As part of those phase two, or what we would say we kind of looked at down the future, it would be that 4MGD water treatment plant at, at the east water plant site, the renovation of that, the lime sludge force main that would take the sludge from that site up to the 34th Avenue site, and then construction of that finish water main tying down into that 20th Street Tower that Dell had talked about. If you look at the costs, and these are all in kind of that October-ish 2020 time frame, so the phase one cost we were looking at about 41 million, 40.5 million dollars. Phase two, 13.5 million dollars for a total project cost of roughly 54 million dollars. And here's a quick, you know, if you kind of look back and here, this is that alternative one, you can see what we have there is two new wells on the north well field, four new wells in the east well field. There's several feet of piping that will be installed be it raw water line, ranging from 16 inch to 20 inch uh, in size. There's a sludge force main that's gonna be installed under that phase two, as we talked about, the renovation of the various plants. And so you can see where we're at with those improvements. So we sit back and kind of look at how are we gonna pay for this? You know, we talk about the funding approach that we're gonna use and when we talked with them, you know, the, the drinking water state revolving fund program is one of the most viable options for, for this to be able to pay off the water treatment plant. We're looking at, it, it, you can get a loan from the drinking water state revolving fund program with a 30 year payback. That's the maximum rate you can get. Interest rates right now are right at about two and a quarter percent. And one thing to note is off of that, it does mandate some coverage requirements that need to be covered. They help cover O&M costs, as well as are used to make sure that we demonstrate financial solvency within the system. When we looked at kind of the anticipated rate back impacts, is which, you know, this is what's impacting each of your customers in town. You know, this is based on the 41 million from that first phase over that 30 year note at two and a quarter. Currently, at, for a average residential user using 589 cubic feet, we're right at a right, right around $37 a month in 2021. When the project's completed in 2024, we'd be looking at about $40.32 a month. So for commercial rate right now, for 4,570 cubic feet roughly, you're at about $155 per month. That would be increased to $169 per month under it. And the way it's projected, from BMU, what they're looking at is using a 3% annual, which lines up with their capital improvements plan 
and that's what they would be using to pay back this loan. Last slide that I have is to talk about the funding and implementation schedule. And the schedule is broken into four, you know, when we talk about kind of four pieces. The first piece being what we're involved in right now, that public engagement and funding. You can see as one of the things that Eric initially engaged with the first district of South and making sure that they engage with the South Dakota DNR, making sure that we get the, the draft report to, the, to the, get on the state water plan. On March 15th, we held the presentation of this draft facility plan report to the utility board. Today, obviously, you know, we're here with, the, with you guys presenting it to the council. We do need to submit by May 1st the state water application form, and then we will be conducting a public hearing. I think Eric has prepared the uh, hearing notice and, and sent that out. July 1st is what we're hoping to hear back for submitting the drinking water questionnaire and submitting that final plan to the drinking water state revolving fund. If you look at the big picture of the construction, you know, when will construction start, design start, what we'll be looking at is probably looking at trying to begin preliminary design of the water treatment plant, probably the largest thing in July of 2021, with a hope that we can be bidding in March of 2022. That is a very favorable time. When you talk to the contractors that do this kind of work, they're trying to line up their work for this, this that, that next season. And when you look at it, that'd be probably construction of two years from April 2022 through June of 2024. And at that point, that plant would be going online. Raw water and finished water lines, you know, we're looking at probably starting in that August time frame, getting, getting some routing stuff. You really don't need to start the design until about October, but all of these will be done so that when the water treatment plant comes online, it will be ready. Well-filled expansion, same thing. We're looking at probably beginning that hydro hydrogeological review for that in January of next year, and then start looking at water rights and the review and approval and getting beginning that March 2022 with that preliminary design and working into bidding that work in November of 2022 so that you're done with the construction late in August of 2023. So everything will be ready to be able to run and you'll see that plant up and running sometime in middle of, of 2024 is what we were hoping. With that, I don't know if you have anything else you wanna? Uh, no, only that the uh, public, that's the official public hearing. We're looking for public engagement and public involvement on that. Honestly, with a relatively, well, I consider it reasonable rate impact, hopefully that minimizes public concern on the project. Uh, I apologize to the ex officios who are going to at some point hear this presentation three times, so you'll get uh, uh, your third dose of it at that May 10th meeting. But uh, that's coming up, and uh, uh, I think we could open it up to any questions you have at this point. And Councilman Wendell, I, I think I have some sense of of the answer to this question, but I thought it was was worthy to discuss. There's been so much public conversation around federal infrastructure investments. And I think there's been broader conversations or, or maybe narrower conversations around, um, you know, that that includes pipes and that includes water. And uh, I'm just wondering if our timing is just off or if there is opportunity, even as we think of the well field expansion, potentially to capture federal dollars and not have to rely on the, the drinking water state revolving fund, uh, or if there's been consideration of potential infrastructure federal dollars. That topic's been really recent, obviously, in the news with the recent election. I hope we're not off. I'm hoping we're timing it well. So I think when we get into, you know, we presented uh, based on, you know, a, a complete loan. Uh, but as programs roll out, we're going to take a strong look, work with our consultants to say we don't want to miss opportunities to capitalize on that. We've got $40 million worth of infrastructure. We would like to find some of that infrastructure, grant money, uh, build America, whatever the Whatever rolls out officially, we would like to capitalize on that, and we'll be looking at that really aggressively as we proceed here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I have just a quick follow-up on that that we may not have a sense of, but I'm wondering how familiar any of you might be with the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund and whether or not there's the potential that 
some of those federal dollars would be directed to that fund that could impact the interest rate or the amount we would have to pay back to that fund or whether or not there's a scenario where the federal dollars would come into the fund that, that we're hoping to access. I'm hoping to learn more about that. I don't know if you guys have been following that uh, as consultants more closely. Yes, we've been, we, we actually have a group that does follow that type of stuff. And some of that is that the funding's, you know, they're looking at trying to get it state, cities, you know, is kind of how they're looking at trying to funnel some of this money out right now. And as they continue to develop their plans, you know, you might see that a lot of it does get funneled into something like the state revolving fund. And when they do that, sometimes what you see in the past, I've seen places where they ended up doing, I'll, I'll say, principal forgiveness. And so they did some grant forgivenesses in, in some of these places. I'm not saying that that's going to be, you know, a given, but this might be an opportunity for them to do it. A lot of these places, they also look for things that are shovel ready. You know, and do, the, do you have something that's ready to kind of go out, and, you know, when they start to roll things out and where it's at? And I think starting now and getting kind of ahead of the game so that you do have stuff ready is, is important too. Any other questions, Councilman Collins? Yes, um, I know this is down the road a little bit, but when the construction starts, will that affect the water flow while you're working on it to Brookings at all? Uh, at, short, at short cutover periods, but in, in all projects where we cut water over from one source to the other, uh, we're working on keeping the water supply alive, so we're not down for any significant amount. Now, that said, there's a cutover time where they're, uh, a customer or an area might be down for a half a day, but it won't be down and out. It'll be one live line cut into it. Uh, sometimes those can be live taps, uh, so the impact should be minimal. Thank you. The impact to the water service should be minimal. At some point, I will need to engage the city staff on the impact to the construction, depending on where those lines are located in 34th. That will be substantial. Uh, disruption to 34th at some point depending on where they're located so I haven't started those conversations yet because I'm not into design but those are those discussions are coming shortly Councilmember Brink I was just gonna ask when does phase two anticipate completion we'll have some latitude on that so phase two right now in our CIP I put it out there oh probably I think it's about eight years out okay. now that could move up or it could move back uh, the east water plant is a good functioning plant at this point. We're not being pushed uh, from an operational standpoint uh, to make changes there, but those are coming at some point. Uh, so it will be, it'll depend a little bit on the growth of the community, uh, the growth, where that growth occurs, because some of that phase two talked about the large pipe to the south main water tower. Uh, it's functional now as growth continues. That'll be stressed to a greater and greater degree. So that'll affect the timing of phase two as well. But in my mind, uh, I think five to 10 years out. And then just a, a clarifier then, uh, with that timeline, the the rates, uh, the loan information that was spec'd out there, that 41 million, that would be for phase one cost, not phase including one. anything for phase two. Correct. Okay. So then would that be an additional loan at that time that that would happen, um, funded the same way, or do we just not know? Uh, likely alone, most of the major uh, water and wastewater plant type projects uh, generally start with a loan. Um, so I would anticipate that. Um, but again, even if we're taking out a $40 million loan and we're having a 3% rate increase, I'd like to think as the utilities we've planned well coming into this project that those rate impacts have been not rate shock, not 10% increase, not something like that to fund those bigger projects. And I would hope for the same uh, relative impact in phase two. And then finally, uh, you mentioned uh, rate increase would be negligible. Besides a potential rate increase and besides potential traffic disruption uh, when, when construction is actually happening, is this team aware of any other objections that the public might have to a project like this? Are there any other barriers that uh, we anticipate? Um, no, I don't anticipate any. Uh, Anytime you put out a $40 million number, you might get public comments on how are you spending that kind of money on a project, what's wrong with your old plants. There's always that potential, but I haven't heard any of that at this point. Uh, so I, I do think the impact to traffic on 34th is, is I guess I'm kind of introducing it right now as a, as a concern, uh, but I don't see the rate impact being 
a major shocker. 3%, so maybe negligible is not the right word, but um, it's still not rate shock in my thinking. So. Thank you. Yep. Council Member Bacon. Yes, um, I think it's slide 14 here where we're talking about <clears throat> the rate impacts. Um, can you tell me if, uh, where we sit in other cities, both with municipal water, but even without, where are we sitting rate-wise? A relative to other communities, is that the question? Our water rates are lower than other communities as we sit right now. Um, so a three, and I don't know that that increase will tip the scale to the higher end of average. So we're below average as we sit now. The wastewater side, we're a little bit above average. So as communities, you look at water and wastewater as a whole, we kind of average out. But the water is the low side of that. Okay, I, I thought we were the lowest or one of the lowest. Uh, and I just hope we can stay that way. I worry about our families that don't have a lot of resources. So yep. thank you. One thing we do produce at AEQS every year is, is kind of individual communities, uh, rural water systems, they supply us with information as far as their rates and, their, and, their, and we put together kind of a little rate impact, I'll say presentation booklet that we hand out to a lot of our clients. We've done it for 15 years at least, probably maybe closer to 20, I'll say. It, it, so. We do have that stuff available also if you ever want to kind of get more information from us. Council Member Tilton Byrne. Um, I'm wondering if you can help me understand a little bit uh, about the difference between um, the possible options that, that you kind of looked at regarding the lime sludge ponds and the mechanical dewatering. Those are two separate types that are options there, correct? Um, can you talk me through maybe a little bit of what, what the difference is between those two? I can do it. Okay. The difference between them is so the the lime sludge ponds are are basically what you what you have right now. They are a a, a remote type of pond location, air dried, very minimal operational impact to it. So you're you're pumping sludge out there, you're allowing it to dry. That sludge then as it can as it continues to dry throughout the year is removed and then it will be applied applied throughout uh, it's land applied land for applied a beneficial within. reuse so with the mechanical dewatering it's on a continuous basis and so you end up putting up a building you put up equipment you're on a, on a daily basis you're putting an in information you're putting that sludge or that residuals of water into it could be a plate and frame press it can be you know a filter press of some sort um, and you're squeezing that water out of it, trying to make that a like a less of a cake, and then it's hauled off on a more consistent basis. And so you have to have a place really to get rid of it at that point, kind of more on a conti continuous basis with that type of operation. Is there a difference in the environmental impact between the two? I'd say no. They're both the same dried. Uh, spent lime sludge, uh, which is calcium oxide, uh, and there's two beneficial reuses for it. So it doesn't end up taking up landfill space. It either goes into a cattle feed lot to firm up the soil, or it replaces agricultural lime that's fed, spent, or spread by, like, say, the co-op. So there's a, there's a, the guy who usually wins our bid for the lime disposal uh, takes it to fields that need a pH adjustment. And it can't just be any field. He has to do the soil testing to prove that it will benefit from the pH adjustment. And oh, it is the same end product, whether you dewater it or just air dry it. Thank you. Um, my last question is uh, about the um, public comments that are going to be um, uh, at the public uh, comment period that's going to be held on uh, May 10th. Um, can you explain uh, where that will be held and how the community can participate? Yep. So that is uh, BMU is still closed to the public, so our, our board meetings are still WebEx virtual meetings. So the, uh, uh, the advertisement has the WebEx uh, address in there. So whether you log in by computer or whether you call in and just have the audio, both options are presented. So they would get this same presentation information and any information they wanted to. So that would be the first time they see the information. 
and they would be able to submit any letters or contact us with questions or feedback, or if they were participating in the meeting, ask their questions directly at the meeting. Great, thank you. Yep. Councilman Niemeyer. So a couple questions that I had were, um, obviously uh, people know that we sell water to Aurora. Aurora was considered, as far as our exponential growth that we're going to expect to see in, the, in that city with the, the housing that they have for a blowout. Um, the other question I have is, when we were doing the wastewater treatment plant, and I'd been a liaison on BMU for 10 years, so I kind of watched the whole process. Uh, when we got Bell Brands in, uh, we had to we had to recalibrate if we could actually handle because they were going to be a high water user and 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 one that was going to to uh, impact our wastewater treatment plant. And, you know, I mean, it, I, I, we don't know if we're going to have another a Bell Brands or not. And so, do, do we have that that cushion to to handle something maybe like Bell Brands that may be a, a high water user? There's Two, two ways that could play out. So we're talking about the life of a plant starting in, you know, construction ends at 2024 to 2045. That's the life of that plant. You get that high user early in that lifespan. You've got that cushion that you built for just residential growth that you would consume at that time. And that would be an acceptable use of that. It might speed up your your 20-year expansion or your 20-year build-out. Um, the other, um, so that is one way that could play out. It depends on the timing of where it falls in the lifespan of that uh, facility plan. The other thing that could happen, we did phase the project with some of those kind of thoughts in mind. So the phase two, uh, we talked about that um, five to 10 years out potentially, but we also have it phased. So if the growth occurs differently in the community and we see it in different areas or we see a big user, at that five to 10 year window when we hit that phase two expansion, if we need to recalibrate and say, we need 12 MGD, not 10 MGD, we have a chance at that point to address it there. Any other questions? Oh, oh. I just got a quick question. Your rates right now, the way I understand it, are more aggressive with the more water you use. With you building a new plant, it's behooved it upon you to operate as a business and try to sell more water. Will those rates still continue to be in that structure, um, assuring that we're good stewards of the, of the water resource and, and trying to be as effective and efficient as possible so that people, as they use more water, will be conscious of that water usage? Or will you be looking at changing that structure? That's a discussion to be had yet. So that is a business model discussion, and I think that's pending yet. But that also factors into Ope's question, which is, you know, really our most stressed period is in the is due to watering lawn watering and so let's say you get an industry in town and he's a baseline load of a million gallons a day 90 percent of the year he's a great customer um but if you crimp down on the water i mean if you look at regulating your i'm going to call it secondary water use which is lawn watering you could also structure your rates so that you could still accommodate that base load and then try to adjust people's watering habits to still keep it in the capacity that we're, we're building 10 MGD. And really that 10 MGD kicks in in July and August. And the rest of the year, that base load is about four, even at build out is at 4.6 MGD. That's a lot of watering capacity. And if you look at uh, managing that uh, lawn watering use, you can look at how you grow as a community and bring customers into the community as well. So as far as the rate structure to be determined. I would just comment that BMU has done a phenomenal job in extending the life of the current water plant through measures like that. I yes. mean, most communities don't understand how important it is to look at your rates, understand how people are using your water resource. I would just put a plug in right now, and I can't remember, are we using um, automatic meter readers where people can look at their water usage and, and understand the per household consumption? We're migrating towards that. So yes, Thank we've you. got uh, uh, remote meters. Um, they're not sending, we pull those, so we, it's kind of a drive-by system now. At some point, that will automatically come back into the system. So as we, we're putting in step one and step two, we'll be sending that information back and making it more and more available to the customer. 
Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. All Great right, information. Thank you. Thank Remember you. May tenth, vote. And if you don't vote, don't complain. <laughs> All right, next. Dusty, you've been sitting over there pretty Dusty's gonna speak to us about the Brookings Urban Forestry Initiative. And so tonight, usually I introduce you as the director of park and rec. Tonight I better say forestry too, right? And, okay. and forestry. Good. Yes. Just make sure. Yes. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, thanks for having me. I I just really wanted to update you within the Park and Rec Department. Um, the first one would be the Brookings Urban, Brookings Urban Forestry Initiative. Um, this was designed to, you know, the people in the community uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, our tree cover in this, you know, in this area. Um, and it's important for a, for a variety of different reasons. You know, first off, aesthetic. But, you know, the urban forest, you know, there's psychological benefits, environmental benefits, you know, there's just benefits to having trees in our community. So we kind of designed this with the intention that we want to preserve that. And there are some, some challenges, you know, as we go forward with the um, I gotta back that up. I gotta give Chelsea credit on that cool logo. That was not my artwork, that's Chelsea's. But yeah, basically we want to talk about the, the future of trees in Brookings. And this is a program we kind of put together, uh, you know, to, to ensure the health and long-term sustainability of our urban forest. Um, you know, there are some threats. Uh, we've got many, you know, mature trees in this community that are nearing their life expectancy. Um, you know, we want to be proactive in replacing some of those uh, so that it has less of an impact when, when we lose some of those. And the other is obviously the emerald ash borer. Um, you know, it's not documented in being in Brookings right now, in Brookings County, but that's just because it hasn't been found. Um, it's all around us. Um, it's likely here. It just has not had a significant impact yet. You know, as a department, we're actually being proactive and, you know, removing some of the poor quality ash that is, exists in the community right now. Just trying to get ahead of some of that. You know, your, your poor quality trees are going to act as a, as a host um, for that pest. So if we can remove some of that, maybe we can delay this a little while. A little while. As far as the program itself, uh, you know, it's essentially a tree replacement program. Um, you know, we do have limited funds, so, you know, particularly this first year is kind of a pro, you know, pilot uh, program. Um, you know, so it's going to be when we run out of funds, <laughs> we're done and, you know, hopefully fund it, you know, maybe at a higher level next year or, you know, be able to secure some, some grant money or, you know, private donations. So, but the, the program details itself, it's eligible to City of Brookings residents with a maximum of two trees per property per year. Um, you know, we do, we have established a, an approved tree species list. And with this program, we're partnering with uh, local nurseries. You know, they have the expertise uh, to help the customers. They'll be, they've been provided the, the tree list, you know, and the ancillary benefits of that is you know, a lot of times when we do a tree order, we order those from outside. Um, you know, talking about economic impact and things like that, that's gonna keep those dollars in the community. So, you know, I thought that was gonna be a win for everybody. Um, so you can purchase your trees at a participating nursery. You know, the approved species list is lengthy. It's like two pages and like really small type. So there's a lot of different varieties out there that, folks can choose from some of those are you know appropriate for yards um, you know if somebody's interested in putting one on their boulevard uh, there's some other restrictions there you know no evergreens on boulevards and things like that but uh, how it works decide where you want to plant your tree you know either in your yard or in a boulevard 
uh, if it's in a boulevard, we're going to ask that you know we approve the location due to utilities and, and things like that. Um, we don't want anything planted in you know site triangles and those type of areas. Uh, the next is visit your local nursery, select a qualifying tree, purchase your tree, save the receipt, bring your receipt to the park and rec office, plant your tree, and be sure to take care of it. Uh, that's kind of one of the one of the things that we're encouraging with this is, you know, folks have gone to the work and, you know, the expense, uh, they're going to have a little more skin in the game and hopefully be taking care of their trees. There will essentially be their trees. Um, and, you know, then enjoy. You know, the costs, you know, approved participants can receive up to $150 per tree and may request a planning reimbursement of $50 per tree for those folks that aren't comfortable planting their own tree. So um, we're going to provide resources both through our forestry division. Um, you know, anybody can pick up the phone and and call them. And then um, tree care and planting tips can be found uh, on the program website. Um, you know, that's going to be, we're, we're going to do, I'm going to say a hard launch. Um, Thursday, um, or actually Friday. It would be, I believe, the 20th. Whichever day is Earth Day, we were gonna we were gonna wait till Arbor Day, which is which is the 30th. Um, but with including this in our program guide, it's getting ahead of us a little bit. <laughs> we already got some folks going. When can I do this? So you know, I visited with Chelsea, and we're gonna make that part of part of the website live. Uh, on that day and uh, go forward. We've already had a couple of folks going, I got my tree. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we'll take care of you. So, the, you know, the the initial feedback has been very positive. Um, you know, there are folks that are excited to be a part of this this project so, or this initiative. So, oh, and there's a nice picture of people planting trees. So, everybody get an aww. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? Yes. Can you describe for me? I've always been curious. What is the city philosophy with trees that exist in homeowner boulevards today? Because I've I've known the city to replace those trees in the past, and so how 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 does that work? I guess I, guess I didn't quite hear or understand. Trees in the boulevard. Yes. So as a homeowner, I know that I've I've had trees taken down by the city and paid for by the city because they were on the boulevard. Is that, does that apply to every residential area in the community or what are those rules? For the most part, okay. um, historically, the, the city has provided trees uh, in boulevards, um, you know, have planted them. Um, you know, that's why we're, we're actually encouraging folks if they want trees in their, you know, in their boulevard, we're still going to you know, provide the funding for that uh, it's this this program is twofold. Um, a we want to continue you know healthy urban forest, but the other part of this is we're gonna you know ask folks to help us at least through the establishment stage, any that are planted in the boulevards. You know, if our staff goes out and you know plants a hundred trees in the boulevard, and the residents aren't helping take care of those, we've got to follow up watering regularly and those sort of things you know long term once these trees get larger and you know pruning anything in the boulevard we will continue to you know trim them back for clearances and things like that but our hope is that you know through this program uh, folks were going to take you know more ownership particularly of their boulevard trees and help us with that process one thing i, I would mention on that um um, hopefully get the number right, Dusty, you can correct me. We have like 10 to 20,000 trees in the boulevards in our parks that we maintain with four staff people mm -hmm. in our community. And so as emerald ash, ash hits us and there's other things that hit our trees, we'll make sure to take care of those trees, take care of them regularly. But this is an opportunity, as Dusty said, for homeowners to participate and help us out. But the maintenance of trees, including trees in their front yards and their backyards, because that urban canopy is so very important to a community. Correct, okay. and you got the numbers right too. Don't never tilt and burn. 
Um, I think this is absolutely a fantastic program. I'm excited to see this happening um, and appreciate um, this program getting started. Um, I have already been sharing it with a lot of people through the, the community guides, so I'm glad to hear that you're already um, getting some calls about it. My question is, um, I, I loved hearing that you've partnered with the, the local greenhouses to, to kind of promote this program and help extend the impact to our community that way as well and kind of buying them locally. Um, have you similarly reached out to some of the local landscapers um, who may be doing the planting for those who aren't able to do it themselves um, and, and talk to them about this program? Because I would imagine they could even um, maybe promote it a bit with, with some of their clients. Right now, we've just engaged the, the tree suppliers, um, you know, because that way they're going there getting their tree. Those folks, actually, part of their their business model is planting the trees as well. So uh, they'll be putting them in the ground at, at, upon request. Anything else? Well, Dusty, as long as we got you, jump right into community <laughs> okay. games. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Brookings Community Games. I'm going to switch to my other slide. Bright colors. Um, again, thumbs up to Chelsea. I, she helped us out a lot with this. I uh, wanted to introduce this uh, program. Um, Paul's familiar with it. I'm fam familiar with it. Uh, I know it's kind of been done in other communities. Uh, in Kearney, we called it Community Olympics. Um, we wanted to avoid any copyright infringement or what have you, so in Brookings we're calling it community games. Same concept. Um, we even use kind of the little connecting rings. Um, right now that what this is, is I'm gonna go to this one and kinda, I can come back to the date. Um, community games is an adult team challenge that includes both individual and team activities. Um, so essentially you put together your team there's, you can see the list of events uh, down on the bottom there. And it's a team from anywhere from 10 to 25 individuals. And you get to pick what events you want to be in. And having participated in this uh, in the past, it's a lot of fun because you get to be a kid again with some of this stuff. You know, how many times do you go out and play kickball? Probably not real often. Um, you know, or, or do some of these other things. You know, a lot of people participate in, you know, a lot of individual sports and what have you. This is an opportunity to get a group of friends together or service clubs or what have you. And in a team environment, um, you know, just participate. We're, this, this event is focused on wellness. Um, but the other important part of this is it develops teamwork, um, community spirit. You know, yes, there's competition involved, but you get a lot of folks from a little, a lot of different walks of life, um, all participating in a in a large event like this, and just some of the friendships that are made, and it's just purely a lot of fun. Um, let me go back to my list. I kind of started wandering. Um, you know, again, it's available to everyone, uh, regardless of age or fitness. Uh, if you'll look through there. There's there's a couple of events there where you don't even need to be athletically inclined at all. Um, you know, sidewalk chalk art. Uh, you know, team banner challenge. You know, basically that one's going to be we're going to challenge the teams to uh, create their own team banner and you know artistic and colorful and what have you, and there'll be judges to to judge those. Um, so again. You know, it's to promote fitness, teamwork, community spirit. Uh, you know, I'm hoping particularly as we come out of, you know, COVID, this will be a, a great event to draw people together. Um, again, focus on the healthy living. And I kind of mentioned before, you know, teams can be put together, you know, businesses, service clubs, churches, um, neighborhoods or groups of friends. When I when I did it, you know, it was just kind of a group of friends. One guy kind of said, "Hey, do you want to be on this team?" And uh, but I, we're going to start actually later this week, and I've already started today, kind of distributing this to you know some service clubs, businesses. You know, SDSU would be a great one to 
put together a team. And as far as how you earn points, you know, points value or values vary per event. You know, you can simply show up to an event and participate and you earn a point for your team. Um, the, the events are scaled, you know, individual events will earn X points for placing, uh, team events, you know, earn larger scale. Um, and then we'll start this, I'll, I'll kind of go back to the, to the date. Uh, June 25th is a Friday, we'll probably start it like Friday afternoon, evening. Uh, the first event will be a yoga. So we'll have however many teams we have there, all spread out, everybody doing yoga. You know, it's just a great way to kick it off. Everybody's looking at each other, laughing at each other. Um, you know, it kind of takes takes some of the stress out right out, right away. So, uh, you know, some other things, how to register. Um, <laughs> we've got community games packets uh, at our office. And some of the, you know, most of this can be found online as well. Uh, put together your team and turn the back packet back in to us with uh, $25 per participant by May 10th. And that's coming up fairly quick. Um, we may extend that deadline a little bit, but probably not much because we have some supplies we need to get and what have you for this as well. Um, all participants will get a, a team t-shirt and Sunday, you know, probably midday, I think is what is on the schedule. There'll be just a meal. Um, probably do that at Pioneer Park, the, the band shell, and have an award ceremony. Um, Brookings Health System is a, a cooperating partner with us in this. Um, you know, obviously, we're, we're going to be promoting health and wellness. They're a large, logical one to be a part of this. So, um, you know, and then, like I said, the last one. The memories from this event will last longer than the soreness in your body. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot of fun. Can I answer any questions? Or offer someone a, a team packet? Yeah, <laughs> well, okay, so uh, obviously you're going to have to have some volunteers in this. Are you recruiting for volunteers also then? Oh, for, uh, for staffing this? Yeah, for staffing it and everything. We are. Uh, we actually brought that up to our our last uh, at our last park board member or meeting and uh, have have asked the, you know the members to to volunteer to staff some of this um, I made sure my wife and daughter were not working that weekend <laughs> so I'll probably be re 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 recruiting them as well uh, and, you know and our recreation staff uh, you know I'm encouraging a lot of our park staff to actually put together a team but uh, if they're not participating in an event, they will probably be helping staff one. Any other questions, comments? I got a comment. Yeah, um, sure. Just for a little uh, competition, Jake and I are putting together a team. In my past communities, city ma council members, mayors, past mayors participated on my teams, and we we're kind of ringers. I bet and they weren't challenged all people the like the county board and other uh, entities out there. Uh, to compete with us so this is a great activity and if you have members on your team that love to do sidewalk chalk while well, you have a ringer that does to do sidewalk chalk if you have someone that loves to do kickball ball you, you don't always have to participate in all the activities <laughs> but it's good to participate in some of them and so i'd encourage you if you're interested in joining jake and i's team of, of ringers and, and uh, throughout that competition friendly competition to the other entities as does well. jake know about this yet or? he's on vacation right yeah now. i thought he was <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for <laughs> Dusty? Uh, for uh, participating. Thank you. Okay, Bonnie, we're down to almost the last item. The city clerk and city attorney will speak to discussion on city council vacancy process. Yes. Mayor and council, members of the audience at home, on May 11th, council member Niemeyer will resign his position as city council member and be sworn in as mayor. This leaves a vacancy on the city council. The process that we will follow is set aside in the city charter and city council policy, which was adopted in 2003 and amended in 2010. 
that policy states the council by a majority vote of all of its remaining members shall appoint a qualified person to fill the vacancy until the person elected to serve the remainder of the unexpired term takes office. What this means is the person that you appoint will be appointed through May of 2022. If that person wants to run for the remaining one year of this two year term that OPE is leaving vacant, they would have to be on the ballot for the election in April of 2022 to fill the remaining one year. So in your packet, we had included a former press release, uh, the questionnaire that was used at the last time this process was used, as well as a proposed process and timeline as, as far as dates. And you'll see on here, we propose starting this process starting Friday, April 23rd with the press release. Uh, Steve is available on Zoom. If you have any questions for either him or myself or changes that you would like to see made to the process with the dates or even the application and the questions that are on there. I think Joe Dell, you covered that pretty well in the paper about timelines and things like that. So thank you. Council questions, Council Member Brink. I had a question on the application. Um, asking if the residence is located within the city limits and if they're registered voters they would have to yes, i'm correct unclear why we would ask that or, or or rather if somebody checks no would you even give us that application as a submission no we or wouldn't would we just okay okay but you know if you're not <clears throat> sure if you're a registered voter no this is pays a pertinent question that maybe we should check our voter registration status if you want to apply that makes sense. They can check it out. And then just um, a very release uh, for the applications. There's just a typo in one of the dates. I saw that. Thank okay. you. Yep. yep. Anybody else have questions? If you have questions, get a hold of the city clerk or the city attorney on this. Okay. All right. Looking. Oh, open forum. Jodell, you have anything? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're, big chance, but okay, looking ahead to next Tuesday night, it'll be a little longer meeting, I got a feeling, and uh, the usual open forums, student association report, um, then performance management presentation by the assistant city manager, police chief Dave Erickson will speak to the South Dakota Resilient Communities, excellent program, uh, first readings on three ordinances dealing with zoning and rezoning and and then uh, contracts and change orders on bid awards for airport uh, maintenance and concrete maintenance on sidewalks and street and overlays. A second reading, public hearing and budget amendment number three, uh, Brookings Baseball Association request for a temporary malt license, liquor transfers. I see we have about three liquor license transfers on that one. And then uh, a discussion on amending the 2040 comp plan future land use map. And then other business, a preliminary plat for Moriarty Square, uh, Brookings Health System resolution, um, and then adopting the Brookings Historic Preservation Plan, city manager, city progress report by the assistant city manager, COVID-19 update by that guy, and uh, any discussion. Anything that's not there, and it's only two pages, that's, I kind of paraphrased it, but anything you want to see added then or <laughs> whatever all right with that said entertain a motion to adjourn so moved and second we have a motion and a second all in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed say